Hello, I'm Dr. Abstract and this is a Zim Basics. We're going to drop back. We realized we didn't do a basics on loops and tickers and timeout and intervals. So those things that will run code over and over again. And so let's go back and take a look at some code basics like that. And we'll, we're at the Zim site here. I'm going to press code and copy the template. I'll reduce this down and paste the template into Atom. Here we go, I have a file called loops.html. We're using Zim NFT here. And here's our code. I'll open this up in Browser Plus. Browser Plus is a package that you can install under packages. Um, in Atom just shows Zim in a browser like that. Okay. So we'll get rid of the circle Boop. where it says put your code here. Uh, let's start with a loop. So a traditional for loop in JavaScript is for var, oh, let these days, let i equals zero, semicolon. Zoom in on that a bit so you can see that nice and easily. Uh, as long as i is less than, say, 10, semicolon i plus plus and you may have seen my few mistakes in there well maybe just one with a comma a lot of people when they begin coding certainly get mixed up with this syntax and i still don't quite totally understand it why there's not another one there it's probably because it has to do the rest of this stuff i'm not not sure anyway if we wanted to loop through an array uh we would have the array const r is equal to uh, whatever. Let's put some colors. Red, green. No, oh, I'm going to have to put, do 10 colors. Well, I can. Uh, red, green, blue, purple, pink. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five. Let's do it. Five. Okay. Or if you are looping through an array, then you might want to do r dot length like that. Uh, yeah, as long as it's less than the length, it starts at zero, so that will work out all right. And then it's R at mm, I. Uh, that will give us each color. So you could say let color equal that, R at I, and you'd be given each color. Okay, agreed. Um, and, and then you would do something with that, uh, whatever it may be. So that's your traditional loop. Here's, here's a Zim loop. Right here, it looks like loop, round brackets, uh, R, comma, and you're given, uh, well, you call an arrow function here, you're given the color. So there you go, you've got color. So that's a Zim loop. Loop through the array, each time get given what's in an array, and indeed ES6, you can reduce that down. So that's a lot easier. There is some sort of JavaScript for each loop or something that actually is kind of similar to that, um, which does something similar where you call a function. I can't remember it, but it may be even exactly the same. It might be something like for each R, you're given the R and that. Um, but Zim loop doesn't end here. And, and let's just back up once. Okay, so that's that's one version of the loop right there. The basic version of the loop, which maybe we can put first, why don't we put it first here, is just sort of loop 10 times and given i. So there's your basic loop 10 times, and each time you're given the index number. So you don't have to uh, do all that stuff, basically. Okay, so that's your, that's your basic loop 10 times, you're given i. You're also given the total, if you want. So there you go like that. So I and comma total. Uh, here you're given in this Zim loop, you're given the the index or sorry, the um, whatever's in the array, followed by the index, uh, followed by the total. You can also loop through an object literal. So an object literal uh, const OBJ 
is equal to a colon has 10 in it, b colon has 20 in it, etc. c colon has 30 in it. So there's an object and you can loop through the object and each time uh, we'll call an arrow function uh, if each time we're given the name uh, so this is the property name comma and the property value and you're also given how many times you've looped and a total of how many times you're going to loop okay so there you get the pair loop through the object get the first thing get the second thing and you can use either one of those that you want in here What's perhaps even handier is if we have a new tile, for instance, a new tile. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, well, we're gonna put that in a variable. Const tile is equal to a new tile. That makes a tile. And we'll center that on the stage. Did we get rid of our circle? Yeah, we did. Okay, so when we refresh, let's see something. We, we get the default tile there. And we can loop through that tile by going tile.loop like that. And each time we call an arrow function, each time we're given the child or the, we'll call it t. Okay, and we can do something with t. t dot mm, move, mov, rand, uh, 200. Let's go rand minus 200 to 200. So what this is going to do is it's going to randomize moving the x. Do you want to randomize moving the ah whatever? That would also randomize moving the y. Okay, so we've just looped through and randomly moved a tile element. Isn't that cool? You can also just use loop. So that's a loop function, and you can say tile comma. So you see how up above we're looping through the array. We're looping a certain number. We're looping through the object literal. We can loop through the tile. That's the loop function. But we also provided a loop method. So if you're looping through a, a container, so a tile's a container, or some Zim display object, it needs to be a container, then you're gonna get all of its children right here. And also, as, as you might expect, you get the, the tile, you get what index we're on, and you get, oh, <laughs> a total. Sorry, this would be, we can't use tile because we use tiles here. Well, we could, but no, probably not. So our tiles, and we get a tile, and it would be tile here. Probably that still works. Okay, so you can get what index we're on and which we may want, for instance, if we want to move it instead of randomly, depending on the index we're on, we could move it i times 20. Let's see what happens. Let's um, dot help that a little bit, 2.5, so just in case they go on top of one another, we can, oh, they don't. That's interesting, look at that. So every time i is increasing, we moved the first one over zero because i will be zero. So that's where the tile would have normally started. This one's moved over 20. This one's moved over 30. Interesting. Don't those all look the same amount moved over? There must be a reason for it. Yeah, I guess so, because it's all moved over 20 from, the, from here. This one moves over 20. This one moves over 40, but it's 40 from here, from where it was initially. Yeah, so it just spaces out, and then the next row goes down. I thought it would. Um, I thought they would get progressively uh, bigger. I don't know why they don't actually. I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> uh, this, this must be right. Hey, it couldn't be wrong. But anyway, that's what we're doing. We're um, moving based on i there, if if we so desire. Uh, by the way, when we make a tile, some of you might think that we'd be looping through the tile quite a lot to say, apply a random color. Let's let's apply a random color. Do we have a colors array? Oh, we do. So we can apply a random color to the tile. Tile.color is equal to... Uh, actually, I, I, I guess it would be we could shuffle. If we want it random, we can shuffle colors. Is it called colors? 
oh, it's called R. We can shuffle the array, and shuffle should have an E, L, E on the end there. So shuffle the array will randomize the array and just get the, the zero element. That's how you could loop through the tiles and get the colors. If you wanted to use I there to, to do the colors in order, right now they're randomly picking from, from those colors. Oh, I was going to say, well, why are these so faint? It's because we've got an alpha on that. Uh, yeah, there, the gym, the Zim colors. So that's us doing that. Uh, but if we wanted to get those in order, then we would use I, we would need I, and we could say R at I. The problem with that is we have more tiles than we have colors. Uh, the solution's quite easy though. You go I percent uh, I, uh, R dot length. Okay, you can just eventually get used to that. This is a modulus. So it's the divisor. We're dividing I by the length of the array. And watch what happens. Red, green, blue, purple, pink. Red, green, blue, purple, pink, etc., etc. So that just cycles through um, that array. Because what happens is, is when it gets too big, the remainder becomes, well, when it's equal, the remainder becomes zero and it goes back to the zero element. When it's one bigger, then the remainder is one and it goes back to the it goes to the one element, etc. And it just keeps doing that. And when it's divisible by two, it'll be back to zero. When it's divisible by two plus one, it goes back to one. So we can cycle through as many times as we want here. Indeed, when we make a tile, uh, the object what we're tiling comes first. We'll just default to the circle, but this might be 100, comma 100. And now we've got a tile that has, as you can see, that cycling through and, and still working. Okay, that's a thousand of those. But what I was gonna say is you don't even need to loop it all for colors. You can just pass, the, you can make a new circle here. You can do it and give it a number and say color, oh, R. That's the array. So this is the Zim V value, where now it's randomly picking from that array. See that? So we, we didn't have to loop through and change the colors because we can change the colors as we're making it. Uh, normally we would put like red here and you would, therefore you're tiling a bunch of red things. But if you put R, which is an array of things, it will then pick from that array if you put a series like that of R, like that, that's that's optional. You can put the array right in here without like the square brackets, or you can pass in an array. You put the elements of the array right in here. You could say, in other words, blue, pink. So here's blue and pink in a series. And we refresh here. Blue, pink, blue, pink, blue, pink, blue, pink. Okay, in a series. But if you want, you can pass to the series an array. And we already have an R. And now it will do what we had before. Red, green, blue, purple, pink. Red, green, blue, purple, pink, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So no requirement to loop through afterwards. Some other things you might think that there needs to be a requirement is to say to drag. You might, uh, we could loop through this. And instead of doing this stuff, we could say tile, and at that point we don't even, you know, if, if, all, if we only need the tile, then that's all we need. Oh, uh, not quite. Right, that's the tile. And then we would say tile.drag. Now we can drag those tiles, or indeed any event, like we could put an event on each of these things. But we don't usually have to do that either, because, well, let's go like this. We can just put the drag right on the main item. And if we put the drag right on the whole tile, it will automatically drag, that's a container, putting a drag on a container, it automatically drags the children, unless you go all colon uh, true. Try, <laughs> try and drag them all, please. 
So there is a drag all colon true, and what that will do is it will drag all of the elements in the container. All right, but by default, our drag is dragging what's called the target of the event. And that's the same with events. You can also put in, you could put events on each one of these things if you think you need a mouse down event on each one, but you can just put the mouse down on the tile and then use e.target to find out which one got the mouse down. So it's not often that we have to, to loop through a container, but it certainly um, is very handy uh, for things like hit tests. When we want to find out if something like an eraser is hitting any of these, we would then want to loop through the container and check each one. That's how a hit test is done. You loop through the container, check each one. If you were going to delete it, let's go. Let's uh, continue on talking more about the loop now. Let's finish up here, like talking about the loop, talking about we got a, an interval, a ticker, and a timeout to talk about as well in this Zim Basics. So let's uh, find out some more things that we can do with the loop. Um, where shall I do these? If we were going to loop through, uh, as we had here, and remove something, like say randomly remove, how about how about we do this? Um, tile dot re remove from, and we're going to remove that tile if uh, rand is greater than 0.5. So what this is doing is it's rolling a random number. And if randomly, if we're bigger than 0.5, this will roll a random number between 0 and 1. Randomly, if we're bigger than 0.5, by the way, that would be the same as math.random as well. This is just a Zim way of doing it. Um, if we're rolling a random number bigger than 0.5, it's going to remove the tiles. So roughly, we're going to remove half the tiles. This will mess up because it's trying to loop through the tiles, but we're removing tile elements. So it, it it will, when it first starts a loop, it remembers how many children there are and basically does a for loop of that number. Well, now that number is wrong because we've removed things. So the answer to that is loop backwards, true, like that. So loop has the next parameter. Loop has, uh, well, if it's a method, the very first thing is the function to run. If it's the loop function here, then we put what we're looping through, or how many times we're looping, and then it's the function. And any one of these, the next parameter, true, would mean loop backwards. So if we were to console.log or zog i there, these numbers are going to go backwards. Let's have a look. Refresh. Look at the console. Uh, there they are going backwards. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so we just loop backwards. Um, it's important to loop backwards when we remove. So now if I refresh here, it's just removing randomly, removing things. Whoa, randomly remove them all. Well, that's going to happen. Okay, so um, that works because we loop backwards. If we didn't loop backwards, it would break. The next one after that is, I don't know, some other parameters. There's a few, there's a few parameters that relate to um, where to start the loop and where, where to end the loop. You see how up here we're just saying loop 10 times. That automatically starts at 0 and goes to 9. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But other parameters say where to start, where to stop, uh, how many to miss, like how many to skip. So it... 95% of the times we loop, we just loop through a number, and that's it. Like the for loop, this for loop right here, uh, it works well for doing, say, start if I want to start at 10 and loop to uh, 200, that's quite easy to do here. For us, it, it's a little bit harder. You would say loop 90 times, or no, 190 times. Uh, it would be something like comma false for us. Uh, looping backwards and then we want to start at 10. I think I think so that's a little bit harder to figure out than this. Uh, a little bit less clear on what we're doing. The thing is though, we are this this format is so unruly to do it all the time when we only really need only, only could benefit from it uh, you know 5 out of 
five out of a hundred times, <laughs> one out of 20 times. It, it's not worth it. It's, it's better to just do a nice, easy loop right away and not have to worry about this, you know, that other stuff. Uh, remember, this is even easier if you don't need the total. Okay. So that's our thinking behind it. And it's certainly born fruit. It's way easier to loop in Zim. Just way easier to loop. Okay. So that's uh, looping backwards. And a little bit about there are other parameters in there too. If you want to adjust instead of just looping, you know, in a regular way, there's other ways that we can get to those. The other thing about a loop though is how to stop the loop. Like with a for loop, you've got two things that we use. One is continue. And that means don't, don't go any further. So you might say if I is greater than uh, 20 or something like that, continue. Uh, that would be stupid because you'd only just go to 20 then or whatever <laughs> you thought you needed there. But maybe you're adding up something or pulling random numbers. And if you get a certain one, then you want to continue and not do the rest of this stuff. So there might be more stuff down here. So continue just means skip, like uh, leave and loop, start the next loop. Okay, so don't go any further, start the next loop. And then there's also break. Break. Oops, my broke my break was broken. So there might be a break, and what break does is it means get out of here completely. Well, uh, this would actually be the same. You know, if you had if it's less than twenty, continue. Oh no, that wouldn't be the same. That would mean that it would skip through the first twenty, and then it would uh, then it would start going. But we don't want, if, if less than 20 break, it's just like the very first time it would break, it would leave the loop. But I don't know, this, the other, the other way, would break after 20. Or if you had some other condition, like if uh, rand is uh, less than, or we'll use a greater than, I guess, greater than 0.9. What this would do is it would loop, 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 loop. But if the, if the random, sorry, if the random number was greater than 0.9, then it would stop the loop completely. Okay, so I, I guess that's a pretty good way to do it. If uh, we'll do, uh, 0.5, continue, and then here, uh, zog, or whatever else we would be doing, zog i. Okay, so this would be the traditional way that a for loop would work. If some conditional here, then continue, that means it wouldn't even try to break, it wouldn't saw guy, so it would just go to the next value. Um, let's go back to zero to 100, just so easier to understand what we've got there, Is it zero to 10. All right, if the random number was greater than 0.9 though, then we don't even continue anymore, we break. All right, I don't know why it would be like this, but there might be some reason. However, there's often reasons to use continue or break. All right, so uh, that's traditional. So how do we do that in a Zim loop? So here's the Zim loop up here. Uh, we're inside of a function. So that's a difference. This for loop right here has just two squiggly brackets. It's not, we're not really inside a func function. It's just do this block of code when this is happening. That's another uh, reason why this is slightly sim more simple is that we've just got, hey, there's our block of code that we're doing. Whereas in here, we've got a function. That means we have to end that, we have to remember to end that bracket there as a little bit more complicated format. However, we do this all the time because we're doing that for a, um, uh, an on method like circle dot on squiggly brackets click comma call this arrow function. We're we're going to see that we also do this for a ticker or sorry a timeout and an interval same deal timeout this time call this function. So um, the format of this, even though it is slightly complicated in in this regard right here. Uh, is something that we do over and over again. So we're, we're, we're used to that. All right, so anyway, uh, we're, we're inside a function here. The function doesn't have a continue, only the for 
or while or other types of loops built into JavaScript have continue and break. We don't have continue and break. So here's what we do in Zim, return. So that just means leave this specific function and then the loop will go to the next time it runs this function. Go to the next loop, in other words. That's great. Uh, but what? how do we do it if we're... Um, if we want to break, if we want to leave the fun, if we want to leave all the functions, we return some value. Okay, it doesn't matter what we return. Ten, uh, hello, or help. <laughs> uh, true. Anything that we return is a break. So this is the equivalent to break. Just return something. Return without returning anything is equivalent to continue. And you know what? That's really handy because check this out. Whatever we return from one of these functions will actually be returned here. So uh, const answer is equal to. So what happens is as it's looping, if it returns false, false gets put into the answer. And basically, uh, underneath here, we can zog the answer or use the answer. And this will tell us if it broke out of the list. Or, bro sorry, broke out of the, um, the loop. Okay. By default, a Zim loop, when we loop, by default, it loops. Uh, it's true. If it completes it all, if it loops all of it, then that's called true. And the answer will be true. But if it breaks, then in this case, it's going to be false because we put false in there. If we put the number 10 in there, if it breaks, then answer would be 10. And that's handy as well because we might want to, you know, break only if the rand is bigger. Well, um, if we ran the random number here, uh, ran var r is equal, oh, sorry, let r equals rand like that. And then we put r here and R here. Say we want to know what it was that broke it. We could return R. That would tell us what random number caused this to break. Quite often when we break out of a loop, we want to know what caused the break or what are we at. Like say we were doing a total and as soon as that total reaches bigger than 2,000, um, we want to know what that total is that reached bigger than 2,000. We're going to break as soon as it's bigger than 2,000, but we want to know what that answer is. So if we just return what caused it to you know, be more than 2,000, then we would have the answer. Yay! All right, so it's a win-win scenario. We have a way to break, and also quite often when we do that break, we want to know the value, and that value gets returned to the, the main loop. So if you haven't done much function returns, this might all be very confusing um, for you. But uh, if you have coded before and know, you know, have run into scenarios where you do want the return value from a loop or a break value, then you can see that it's quite elegant. We have that answer um, right away there. And a return's easy enough. So that means we don't have to even know about continue and break. We're just using traditional function things here. We're returning or returning a value for continue and break. So that's uh, that's it for the Zim loop then. All right. Um, uh, let's take a look at an interval now. And intervals and timeouts, probably a timeout first. We'll do this up top here. So timeout. Uh, well, first of all, JavaScript has a set time and I never know if this is going to be like that, but it's not. Uh, so it's lowercase. Uh, JavaScript has a set timeout, which is, belongs to the window. But if if it belongs to the window, if we don't put it by default, it will be on the window. So set timeout. And in here, you run a function, an arrow function. And, and uh, you do something, zog, uh, high, or whatever. You know, you'll zog something or do something in there. Often, at this point, I've forgotten to even put the time in because I'm, I'm now thinking about what goes in my function. The time actually goes at the end. So after five seconds, oh, actually, it's in milliseconds. Mm, there we go. 
So, well, okay, that's five seconds right there. So after five seconds, that would zog. This is JavaScript. Here's Zim. Timeout, first of all. So um, it's a little bit easier than set timeout, but timeout, we say five seconds, call this arrow function. So that's Zim, and inside here we have zog. In other words, we've swapped the order of the seconds and the function, primarily because this is the same order that we use here and in other places, like in our loop. How many times are we going to loop? There's the function. What are we doing? There's the function. Time out. How long? There's the function. OK. And with the seconds coming first, it that's a thing, you know, that we, oh, yeah, time out for this many seconds, call this function. I mean, that just makes sense. Time, set time out, call this function, and then have the time afterwards. The reason why they did this is you could not specify a time, and this will run as fast as it can. But I have never, ever done a timeout where I needed to do that. Maybe once. It's just like minor delay, like any time you set here, you would set a timeout. On occasion, we set timeout 0 0.01 or something, or very, very small time, then run. It's just sort of like a it's called a race condition thing where you just need something else in the programming to just finish. It doesn't quite have enough time to finish and add, the, you know, so it just very rarely will that happen. It's just not worth it to put the function first and this second so that you, cause you don't have to specify it. See, the thing is, if, if that were to happen, uh, what was this at 500 or whatever, half, oh, 5,000, I think we did five, that's five seconds. Um, we could do this, no. That's all you have to do. You just like pass in null. Who cares if it's uh, or in ES six now it's uh, undefined. A little bit higher, harder, but uh, I don't know why they did that. It bothers me. Anyway, um, so you could just do that to run right away. Do you get it? So often, what you do is, when you make parameters, you put the the required parameters first and then the optional parameter second. It's just sort of like, yeah, you're always required to do a function, yes, and this is optional. But the thing is, this is optional one out of 10 million times you would, <laughs> well, maybe not 10 million, <laughs> but you hardly ever, really, that's almost required as well. Anytime you want to set a time out, hey, it's got the word time in it, you're probably going to put a time in it. Um, so anyway, I don't like the way that they did that, and so we fixed it in Zim. So that would be after five seconds, call that. Same with interval. Interval is basically the same. Interval, we have, there's set interval and it works the same as that. So set, inter, set interval works the same as that. Timeout only happens once. A set inter, like a set interval would happen over and over again. Well, we've got interval. And uh, so now every one second, call this arrow function. So that's the zim interval. After one second, call this arrow function. But we have some cool other things that really help with intervals. Say we want to drop flowers on, onto somebody catching these flowers with a basket. <laughs> we don't want to drop a flower every second. It's sort of like, that's not very natural. So what we can do is use the zim v values here. Uh, and we can put in a min of one second and a max of three seconds. So what this would do is we're passing that value into the interval. The interval says, oh, okay, every time I run an interval, I'm going to pick from whatever you passed in there. So that's one way. You could pass in one, two, three, oh, that one comma, two comma, three. So you can pass in an array and it will pick, there we go, 30. It will pick randomly from this array. Sometimes it'll be one second, the next interval might be one second again, then it'll be 30 seconds, and it'll be two seconds and 30 seconds. Okay, so isn't, isn't that cool? And you could also pass in a series, which was fascinating because I played notes in here. I get play notes in here, and when you pass in, in a sense, you're passing in the timing of the notes, so a series. Uh, play the first note 0.5 seconds, the next one 0.5 seconds, but the next one I want you to hold one second, comma, 0.5 seconds again. So there's a series, and this will just repeat. It'll be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, etc. Isn't that cool? 
Um, you can also pass in the results of a function, but that's more talking about the ZIMV values of uh, PIC, PIC it's called, um, or ZIC. And that's maybe a whole other basics. If we didn't already do a basics on that, that would be sort of fun to do. So anyway, there's our interval. There is more to the interval though, aside from ran like randomizing the time. If back in JavaScript, you would have to do a set timeout. What you would do is a set timeout, call a random number, and then call the same set timeout again afterwards. Oh, that reminds me, there is a way to clear um, timeouts or you put this in a function. So the whole thing would go in a function, it would set a timeout and it would call that named function again, which in case it would set a timeout, call the name function again. That's how you would do them with random times. Could be done, but it was annoying. Here, much easier, just pass that in like that. Uh, the next parameter here, oh, uh, remind me though, I've got, <laughs> remind me, will you guys remind me? We have to show how to clear an interval or clear a timeout. Uh, there's a parameter here called or a parameter for, I think this is start right, no, this is how many times? Can't remember for sure. Uh, you can look it up. How many times to run the interval? And then this one, true, means start right away. So don't wait one second before you drop that first flower. Drop it right away, then wait a second, then wait a second, etc. That would do it 10 times. Nice, huh? So that will stop the interval after the 10th time and start right away. Okay, so those are handy parameters to have that really help out quite often. How to clear an interval, uh, there's a couple of ways. One, you get an OBJ in here, some sort of inner, like a, an object, the, the interval object we call it. Similar to an event object that you get in here, this tells us extra information about the event, like the target, what was clicked on. Here, this tells us extra information about the interval, such as obj.count which tells us what number we're on. That's great. Now we don't have to set a count variable up here and increase it each time to find out which number we're in. We're, we're given it. Uh, there's also obj.total, which um, if you specify a certain number of times to go, you would get, well, how many times are we going to go to? But there's also obj.clear as a method on that. So that's one way. If you run a random number, say like we did before here, Instead of return, uh, you could just say obj.clear. So, hmm, far is greater than five. Oh, we don't have the r anymore. So we assign that to a random number. So, if the random number is greater than 0.5, clear the interval, and it won't it won't do the interval anymore. Okay, that's one way. That's how you can do it from within the interval. But quite often, you're not clearing an interval from within. It relies on something else that you're doing. Like say, when we click on the circle, clear the interval. So how would we click on the circle, clear the interval? Well, then you say uh, const inter is equal to our interval. And in here, you say inter dot clear. Okay. Um, normally, to do uh, to clear a set timeout, or well, I guess we could clear a set timeout. It would be const to is equal to that, and then you would say clear enter or clear timeout to. Okay, so just as easy, same same kind of thing. Okay, that's how you would stop. Uh, well, this would clear it right away, but if we wanted to clear it when we hit the circle here. Okay, that would be clear timeout, the TO. That would clear this timeout, because we stored it there, same way here. Stored the interval or the timeout, the zim timeout in a, a variable, and then we use the clear method on that instead of a, a, another global function, or I guess a method of the window. Okay, so I think that's all about intervals. Yay. You good on that? Remember, we got a couple extra parameters here. We can pass in the ZIMV values here. Uh, have a read in the docs. There might be a few other things about it, but I think that's uh, generally it. And remember, this is going to go every second. Bump, 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 bump. Well, what if you want to just constantly be calling a function? Constantly. Like at the frame rate, it's called. 
If you want to do that at the frame rate, it is um, ticker. We use the ticker.add. So it's a little bit different. Ticker.add arrow function. We use a method directly on the ticker class. The ticker is ticker is one thing. There's one ticker, just like there's one math. There's one ticker. And that way, uh, the timers don't all get mixed up or they don't, don't have multiple times. You really only need one thing going at the frame rate. And anytime we want to add a function that will, that will be called at that frame rate, we can do it just like that. Or, and indeed, you could have a function anim or something, anim, round brackets, squiggly brackets. So you could declare a function here and just pass that in as well, anim. All right. And that would work. So just add some function to it. And there's my function. But usually we use uh, an anonymous function or a function, or an arrow function in this case now. Okay, so uh, let's see. Let's put this after the... Where did we put our tiles? There's our tiles. Tiles. Mm. We can either use tiles.items at zero. That's an we're given an array of items in the tiles, or we can use the the createjs get child at zero uh, dot x plus plus. Ready? Oh, mm. you we're getting an error. Okay, let's. Comment out some of this stuff. I don't know where we would have gotten our error intervals. Do we have an interval? obj.count, zogs. Okay, we'll just try and comment out that stuff. Oh, but we need the tile. It's here. Loop. I'm not going to bother removing from. And what have we got? No tiles. Okay. Errors. What do we got? Adam, Adam sometimes, oh, there there it was, loses its ability. I caught R is not defined. Okay, so we're missing an R somewhere. Loop R. Where was our R? There it is. Okay, so um, off she goes. We've, we've taken a ticker, and in this ticker, each time we're... Come back here. Interesting. See what just happened? This is get child at zero. And every time we pick this up, it comes up to the top, so it's no longer at zero. So the next one is a zero. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So um, if I pick this up, it's at the top now. It's no longer get child at zero. However, items, items will remain, items is an array of the the ones in order. And that, that doesn't change, I don't think. So, yeah. So items is just what was the order at the beginning. And it doesn't change. And so now we can pick that up. It's always the first one, no matter what we do here. Even though this one is up on top. It's no longer child zero, but it's still items zero. Okay, so that's a ticker running at the frame rate. You can set the, ch the frame rate as well with ticker dot uh, set frames per second. And um, let's go with five frames per second. And then when we refresh here, you can actually see it chug one, you know, it's doing this five times a second, but that's visible for us. Um, 30 frames per second is apparently not visible for us. We can't, we can't see it. So that's running smoothly. It's hard to see little chunks in there, which is, which is true. All right. Um, but anyway, we probably don't want to set the frame rate. And the other thing is about a ticker is how to remove it. How do we stop that from, from removing? You assign it to a variable const, well, Actually, we have to be careful. If we ever want to remove it and then add it back again, 
No, I think we can we can do it fine. We can still call it a const ticker lowercase is equal to. So there we have it now in a variable. And what we would do is up above when we did our mouse down or whatever it was. Did we take that out? Okay. Hopefully we can bring that back. Um, ticker, tickler, ticker dot remove. Oh, no, we do it on the main ticker. Ticker dot remove. So there's ticker dot add and there's ticker dot remove. And we remove the uh, somewhat like events work. Uh, with an event, if you want to stop the event. No, this is an event. <laughs> right, <laughs> I've gone down looking for the event and I'm in the event. But if we want to stop this event, we would say uh, const e, eve. But we don't use a const in that case, and I'll tell you why. Let So let the event obj, whatever, I'll just call it ev. Let ev equal this. If we ever want to remove it later, we say ev dot, uh, oh, we say circle dot off ev. There, uh, nope, almost, click, comma, ev. So that's the official way to uh, add an event. You store it in a value. And then you say, this was circle dot on, click. You would say circle dot off, click. And you would say which event function, it's off. In raw JavaScript, you can call this a function name and put that function name there. But in create.js, it's better to do it this way. And this is also available in raw JS as well, this technique. And it's the preferred way here in Zim due to create.js. All right, so that's similar to our ticker. Our ticker, we store the whole this this whole thing, the result of that in a variable. And if we ever want to remove it, then we say ticker dot remove instead of circle dot off. Like this was on off. We've got add and remove, and the ticker doesn't have an event type, so we just pass in the ID there. And watch what happens. Oh, I don't have a circle. That's that's why this is giving us an error. We don't even have a circle yet. Uh, so we'll make a circle. <coughs> Const circle is equal to a new circle dot add. Uh, well, dot, we'll position it dot pose zero zero. The difference is circle has its registration point in the middle. So if we just add it, it would be a circle up here in the corner, but like centered on the very corner. Loc, would, loc 00 would do the same thing, but pose 00 will position the edges like that, and then we'll see the full circle. Now, when I click the circle, you know, on click, ticker.remove from, we may have gotten an error because that didn't seem to work. No error. Okay, let's see, ticker.remove from ticker, and what have we got? We've got a ticker down here, which is const ticker, ticker.add. Off she goes and circle. Oh, I took off the event. <laughs> and cl and clicking on it is not working because we removed the event that I'm clicking on. Okay, so let's not remove the event and see if it works. There we go. Okay, so I click that and it stopped moving. Refresh. There we go. Let's move it up here. Click, stopped. So that removed that. It would have also put the timeout off and put the um, whatever that clear was for some. Oh yeah, that clear was this this one. The other timeout thing was the plain JavaScript timeout. Anything else about a ticker? Uh, one more thing about the adding and removing though. If you say wanted to add it again later, so as soon as we click, we're going to remove the ticker. Let's try adding it again. Uh, timeout, we'll use a timeout after three seconds, comma, um, call this arrow function. And in the arrow function, we're going to add it again. Ticker.add, ticker. So you don't need to specify what was in there because it already recognizes that uh, like so. So let's try it. 
So this means when we click it, it's going to stop. So there it is stopping, but after three seconds, it will start again. And there was the three seconds, and it started again. Okay, and that will continue to work that way. Events are different and subtly so. So it's not really a Zim Basics exactly. This is more a JavaScript Basics. Well, not even a Basics, more of a JavaScript Advanced. To add and remove events constantly, and this is really awkward because uh, we're in the event that we were at, or <laughs> using the event to add. <laughs> anyway, to add and remove the event after, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll show it to you. We won't go any further than that, though. There you see that we're removing the event. If later we want to add it again, um, time out, uh, three seconds, kind of an like arrow function like that. You might think we do something similar. And it almost works. So this will actually work. We'll turn it off. And after three seconds, we'll turn it on again. But we can no longer turn that event off. So we turned it off once. We turn it on again. But when we turn it on here, we don't have the event object for this event that got turned on. We only have the event object for this event right there. So in other words, we have to remember to go EV is equal to that. So we have to turn that back on. The ticker, the ticker doesn't work the same way. The ticker just remembers that we've got ticker. So after another timeout, we could turn it off again, and then we could turn it on again, just always using ticker. But events don't work that way. We've got to assign this new event back to EV if we ever want to turn it off again using an ID. So that's a bit awkward, isn't it? That's why this EV needs to be a let, can't be a const, because if it were a const, we'd be it's this event object that's in it, if we try and reassign this event object, or not event object, event ID, it'll break because it's, it's a different one. So we need to use uh, let here on that. Anyway, like I said, that's advanced JavaScript here late in the Zim basics. <laughs> Sorry about that, huh? <laughs> Alrighty. Um, have a great day. Oh, yay, just in time. We'll take it easy. Bye-bye. I'm going to go answer this. Cheers.